I'll start with a conflict of interest slide. So I will, um, I am a co-founder and consultant, as uh, Dan mentioned, on a startup called Alteryx Bio. I will talk about this company, but you know, it has no um, human products, so or it's just uh, very early stages, but really to highlight the innovation aspect. Um, so the goal this morning is to kind of give a brief overview of bariatric surgery and its outcome, um, focus on an area that we're particularly interested in, this variability in weight loss that we see after bariatric surgery, and then really uh, talk about some of our translational research. Dan asked me to kind of pepper the story with some personal journey and lessons learned, and I'll be certainly happy to do that and uh, do that during it. So I think we all know the uh, magnitude of the obesity epidemic in the US, uh, which despite multiple efforts has continued to grow. And most recent data shows that about 42% of the US population is um, um, obese. And there's very little argument that obesity is bad, right? So we know it reduces life expectancy. So uh, for someone with a BMI of 40, life expectancy is reduced by about eight years. It's equivalent to being a heavy lifelong smoker. There's significant cost, there's poor quality of life, and all of this stems because obesity is associated with significant morbidity, com comorbidities, and this body, this picture captures all the comorbidities that are associated with obesity. Pretty much every organ from your brain to your toenail is affected adversely with this disease. But the pathology that has really received the most amount of attention is association of diabetes with um, obesity, where if you, if you look at this data on the right, um, it, can, it shows that even when you start at a normal BMI, so 23, 24, as your BMI goes up, there is a um, linear increase in risk of gallstones, hypertension, heart disease. But when you look at risk of diabetes, it has the steepest association. So for a female patient who has a BMI of 35, if you compare them to a normal BMI less than 25, their risk of developing diabetes is 61-fold higher. So this is really an incredibly strong association. And despite all the us knowing it's bad, and at multiple levels, including health policy, governments, and various other people trying to improving, there has been little pro in, uh, progress. And this shows the prevalence of obesity in the world. And as you can see everywhere, you, from Africa to Europe to America, this rate has steadily increased. And in fact, we now live in a world where more pe people live in countries where obesity kills without malnutrition. And parallel with this, we've seen an increase in type 2 diabetes, where uh, you know, there has been an anticipated 51% increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes over the next 20 years, with massive um, growth anticipated in China and uh, Middle East. And our approach for treatment of this really uh, disease has been fairly simple. You just got to diet and exercise. And I don't know about you, but most people's response to diet and exercise is this. Uh, and we know it doesn't work. And, and if you don't trust me, I would suggest you watch some TV because you've seen this, this show, The Biggest Loser, where they bring people to, to um, a special location. They go on six weeks of intense dieting and exercise. And usually this is what you see. This, I'm, go, I'm showing you data from the 2009 um, um, uh, Biggest Loser competition, which was actually the subject of an NIH study. So they took the patients, and as you can see, uh, after the duration of the uh, period in the study, a lot of people lost a lot of weight. The winner actually lost 239 pounds. But then they decided to follow these people down for six years. And, and what happened? is that majority of these people regained their weight, except one. Everyone else regained. And my experience with this cohort is this yellow line. This guy here called um, uh, Rudy, he was very famous during, because he lost the competition by, I think, a couple of pounds. And he presented to me when his weight was going up at this trajectory. He had a sleeve gastrectomy. And this is his weight now over the last um, <clears throat> five or six years, or four, four years actually that he's been with us. He went from BMI of 49, he's maintained his BMI at 35. And what he talks about is that how this diet, what, what he talks about is what we know, how this diet and exercise is different. Like you, your hunger is still there, but you're fighting it. And you can win in short periods of time, but ultimately you, you, you lose and your biological drive to eat comes back and you regain the weight. What surgery does is it resets your hunger point, your BMI threshold, and your weight point, 
so you can maintain a, a, a better weight loss. Um, and, other, and we know that diet and exercise is um, unsuccessful further because of a recent study that was published. This was published a few months ago, and it showed this, highlighted this kind of what people call compensatory response. So we usually think that, uh, this is just best summarized here, is that you know, we, we, in humans we have this basal metabolic rate, which is really what our brain and liver and everything else uses, and it's pretty much constant all the time. And then we have 30% of our energy is used with energy uh, activity. And what we usually think is this activity model, which is that you exercise, you're, therefore your energy expenditure goes up, and therefore you lose weight. But what that study showed was that actually what happens is this compensation model. So as we exercise, in an effort to preserve and maintain our weight and energy, we drop our basal metabolic rate. So the total expenditure doesn't change. And in fact, the higher your BMI is, the better you are at dropping this. So that's why the higher BMI actually struggle even more to lose, to lose weight. So as a result, um, you know, bariatric surgery has become the gold standard treatment for durable, meaningful weight loss, especially in uh, morbid obesity. And there are two operations, and I won't talk about it much, that we commonly perform, the sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass. And, you know, as a bariatric uh, field, we have really progressed a lot, and we do these operations really well. Most of these are done with one-day hospital. Sorry, it's not working. Uh, most, uh, mo uh, um, most are done with one-day hospital stay. Morbidity and mortality is equivalent to any regular kind of abdominal operation, not much different than from having a lap coli, to be honest. So we do them really well. And we know that the results in the long term when you take a cohort is pretty good. So this is a study I was involved with. It's a PCORI-funded study where we looked at 40,000 patients in the U.S., across the whole U.S., and looked at their weight loss outcomes at bariatric surgery. And I'm going to just focus on the sleeve and the gastric bypass that after a year, in case of a sleeve, patients lost about 25% of their total body weight. And when you look five years down the road, there was some weight regain. It, it's normal to have some weight regain. Uh, they had maintained, the cohort had maintained about 18% weight loss. And when looked at gastric bypass, patients lost about a third of their weight. And at five-year follow-up, they had maintained a 25% weight loss. So pretty good. And then underlying this is that not only do they lose weight, but they get healthier and better. So this study comes from the lab study, which was a consortium of, um, I think it was uh, multiple sites that recruited several thousand patients who had had bypass. Um, and they looked at comorbid resolution at seven years. And as you can see, diabetes, hypercholesteremia, hypertension, everything is better. And I just want to specifically focus on diabetes because that gets a lot of attention. You know, they had a remission rate of around 70% that was maintained at 60 at five years. So really pretty good outcomes. And along with this, people end up living longer. So the life expectancy of bariatric patients who have had bariatric surgery improves, and mortality rate from cardiovascular and type 2 diabetes dramatically reduce. And importantly, cancer mortality goes down by 60%. So you get less cancers and you get better prognosis once you have it. So I've, in, it's, you know, I've probably told you that this is a great operation, right? It's hard to argue. But then the question becomes, why if we have such a great operation, so few people have it? So of the people who qualify for bariatric surgery, only 1% to 2% actually move forward. And there's lots of reasons for it, and, you know, there's risk of surgical risks. Uh, you know, we blame the insurance companies, and definitely that plays a key. But really, I think that ultimately patients don't like to have an invasive operation that permanently changes their GI tract. And also, the result of the operation, when I've told you, it's pretty good at a cohort level, but there are individuals who don't do well. And especially in terms of weight loss, you know, every bariatric patient who comes to clinic knows a friend or a cousin or a brother who had had surgery, has regained weight, they're back the weight they were before, and they're really worried about this. So diving in into this weight loss outcome of the procedure, um, I'm re referring data from the labs study again, and 
what happens is that you can divide weight loss patients into several cohorts. In this study, they did six. If you put the 30% line, which is where we, ex we tell patients this is on average how much they're going to lose, in reality is that about 50% do that, but there are people who do worse, and there are a few people that do better. <clears throat> and bariatric surgery is kind of a funny field because in most fields of surgery, let's say you take cancer, if patient has a cancer operation, their cancer comes back, we don't really blame the patient, right? We just say, well, the surgery and the biology was not good. But the bariatric surgery is different. So when they, you're dealing with these patients at the bottom who've done well, you congratulate the patient and the surgeon. You say, God, you guys are amazing. You've done such a great operation. But then when the patient, oops, sorry, but when the patients do badly, what we do, we just blame this patient, right? We say, oh, you know, you, you ruined my beautiful operation. And I think the, the reason this mentality comes is that we, we think of our surgeries as these perfect interventions, and then after surgery, because of their post patient's post-operative behavior, that determines what the outcome is. Some people do well, some people don't do well. And the reality, I think that this is different. Um, so let's see, is there any evidence that post-operative patient behavior actually makes, has an impact? So this is a, uh, the study that was done. They looked around at several thousand patients, and they looked at their post-operative behavior. I've listed it all here. Uh, and looked at three uh, outcomes after weight loss surgery. Some of the stuff that is listed here is like we think of it as like a must. If you don't do it, your surgery is ruined. Like you have to see the dietitian, you have to do this. So they looked at all these factors and they actually didn't identify any strong be post op behavioral factor that influenced the outcome. There were a few that were the strongest. So the strongest was that, yep, yeah, you should, if you weigh yourself weekly, you tend to do better. If you stop eating when full, you do better. And also, if you don't graze or eat continuously, you do better. So these last two, they kind of tend to make sense. So like, why patients do this? It, like, they know they shouldn't do it. Why are they doing it? Is it really they're weak and not listening to us? Or is there something else going on? And then also, when you take all of these factors together and throw it in, it only explains 16% of variability in weight loss outcomes. So a lot of it is still unexplained for. And the interesting thing to me is that they found is that if you do these three behavior, the one I just highlighted, if you do them before surgery and you continue it after surgery, it doesn't affect impact, uh, outcomes. It only impacts outcomes if you actually pick up and do it or don't do it, in that case, after the operation. So our theory has been that this paradigm is probably not correct. And what is happening is that obesity is a complex disease. There's lots of reasons, lots of genetic, environmental, et cetera, factors that drive obesity. And there are probably different subtypes of obesity. And when we do an operation, we're not doing a perfect operation. This is no longer about Dr. Azaguri's perfect operation. This is just about doing an, op an operation. Some people do well because they, that phenotype of obesity responds well to surgery, and some don't. And we really kind of moved away, especially in our group, about blaming patients or stuff about the outcomes and are trying to say, and we've started to focus on can we identify preoperative indicators, and these are biological indicators, that may help us differentiate between different types of obesity so we can guide patients to do better afterwards? Um, so it's really this concept of is this biology driving that outcome or is it patients? So with this um, study, we, we've um, taken about 100 patients. Uh, we've taken blood samples from them, all of them. And of this 100 cohort, we now have three and five year follow up data. And we did a detailed analysis on, uh, on their weight. Now, these were all my patients. And I can tell you, I thought I'd do the perfect operation. I thought everyone is going to have an amazing weight loss. I will not have patients that don't do well. And it turns out my patient weight distribution of these patients after five years is exactly what I showed you in the other curve a third do average, a third do less, a third do more better than expected. So we, we took um, data from the top performers, these are patients who've lost the most, and compared them to the ones that have done the, uh, they've done the best and compared them to the ones who've done the worst. 
And essentially, when we looked at a lot of preoperative phenotypes and a lot of preoperative hormones, we looked at insulin and ghrelin and leptin and GLP-1 and all kind of other stuff, we found that only two things really helped predict greater weight loss at five years, and that was patients who were younger and a preoperative ghrelin level. So the question became, could preoperative ghrelin help us predict weight loss better in, the, in, in patients? Um, and when we proposed this idea, the first thing people said, well, don't waste your time, Ali. We already have calculators that help patients predict their post-operative outcomes. So why, why do we need this? Um, and, I, and I don't know if um, at your institution you use the MBS QIP calculator, but for patients who are, uh, for, sorry, for people who are unfamiliar, we have a very large national database where outcomes of all bariatric patients goes into it. And using this data, the ACS through MBS AQIP has created a calculator that's freely available. And you can go to it and you put in the patient's demographics and it predicts the patient's weight loss at one year. And as you can see here, this is a patient, this was a typical patient in her 40s, BMI in the 40s, having, deciding what to have. And it showed this data, they showed, okay, you know, I can see actually the sleeve is going to lose about 30% of your weight for this patient. The bypass, this patient will lose 35% of their weight loss. So there's about, a, for most of these uh, the two surgeries, the difference at one year is about five years. So, so how good is this calculator? So we took the same 100 patients that we had data for. We put them all in the calculator. And we said, okay, how good was the calculator in predicting their weight loss? And it turns out in 50% of the cases, the calculator was wrong by 5%, which is the usual difference between. So it really wasn't that great. And then when we took the ghrelin level of these patients and looked at it, the ones who had done better, sorry, the ones that had higher ghrelin did better in terms of post-operative weight loss than the ones that didn't. Um, and so this, this data actually had just been accepted for a plenary presentation at SSAT, so we'll, we'll talk about it more then. But really it shows to us that there is a biological driver that helps determine outcome, and this is not all patient-related factors. Um, and really maybe this is the disease rather than the patient. Now, having said that, I, 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 there's no doubt that some behavioral elements are probably important, but maybe the interactions are complicated. So this is a, um, um, an NIH grant that I co-PI with Frank Shear, a brilliant um, circadian um, uh, researcher at the Brigham, and we submitted this grant uh, three years ago, so we've now started year four, although two years of the three have been in COVID years, so our recruitment is terrible. And you'll see rough leaflets like this everywhere in the country because we're desperate to recruit to catch up with enrollment targets. But um, the, essentially the idea here is that when you look at a patient that, uh, and their dietary habits, so every circle, this, the time here is a circadian time, it's not a clock time, it's not your watch time, it's just your biological time. And it shows that depending on the day, patients eat you know, at different times, and uh, you know, roughly at the same time, right? This is probably lunch and this is dinner. And it tracks uh, through an app, we track the size of the meal, the amount of calories, the, con the mixture of the food. And we believe what happens after surgery, we, we believe that, that these patterns change, and this is a few pilot patients we had. Um, and people, not, on, not surprisingly, eat smaller amounts. But the eating pattern is a little bit different. You see, this patient eats more in the morning, less at night. This one tends to eat a bit more at night. This is a little bit all over the place. And we believe that through some pilot studies that came out of Spain, actually, that this, it is the pattern of eating, and not just the calorie alone, also impacts of outcomes of bariatric operation. So we're, we're, we're on this study, we're doing this study, and then we have developed a, a kind of a, if you like, a circadian intervention in terms of meal timing to help patients who have had poor outcome to see if we can improve their weight loss outcomes. Now, um, most of the talk so far has been, has been about weight, which is very important, but it, it is also important to go back to the fact that patients get better, right? The health gets better. They just feel healthier and they're better and 
um, the, and of the kind of the comorbidity of that, as I mentioned, has created the greatest attention is this resolution of type 2 diabetes. Now, initially, you think, well, your diabetes gets in, getting better after bariatric surgery and weight loss is not rocket science, right? You, we've known for decades that if you're obese and you have diabetes, you lose weight, your diabetes is going to get better. We've known that for a long time. But what is remarkable from, uh, for bariatric surgery, and this is data comes out of our institutions and lots of other institutions have shown this, is that at the time of discharge, so this is the day after surgery, patients who've had gastric bypass, but um, about 26% of them leave the hospital off medications. And this, so there seems to be this early weight independent improvement in diabetes. And then as your time goes on, there's steady further increase in improvement in diabetes remission, which probably is weight driven. But there's definitely some kind of magic to this surgery with this, this early weight independent improvements. Um, and this has been the focus of our work for the last 15 years. This is our lab uh, at the Brigham um, on the 15th floor of our Thorn. I um, run the lab with uh, uh, one of my co-PI, co Dr. Eric Shu, a brilliant bariatric and uh, scientist who's been with us for the last several years, also R01 funded. Um, and we've been really trying to understand essentially the mechanisms of this early in weight independent diabetes resolution after bariatric surgery with the goal of replicating that effect. Um, I'm going to pause here to kind of review really how I got here. So as, as Dan mentioned, I, I graduated in England. Uh, I for, originally from Iran, grew up in England, went to medical school, um, and I started my surgical training. And I kind of knew a few things. One, I wanted to be a surgeon, surgeon. So to me, and what that stems from, I, as a medical student, there was a surgeon in our um, um, hospital who all the other surgeons went to. He never talked much, to be honest, but he was just like an amazing operator, super nice to his patients. And I was like, you know, this is my role model. This is what I want to be. But when our medical school finished, we had to do compulsory house jobs. Um, and over there, they kind of pick you. I actually didn't get his job. I was devastated. And I actually got my uh, professor of surgery's job, so in theory, more prestigious. But I really didn't want it because there was other th one thing I knew was that I don't know what surgical research is, but I know I don't want to do it. It just seemed really boring, like a lot of work. I was like, there's no way I want to do this. And the third thing I had was that I hadn't really thought about surgical education. Do I evolve? Do I contribute? Um, Dan mentioned this concept of triple threat, which we talk about in surgery and academic medicine a lot, where this is someone who does research, does uh, great clinical care, does a lot of teaching. I was kind of more like a BB gun kind of situation at this point. Um, and I was plodding along and I was happy, but the, my program in England, uh, after a few years, uh, I asked me to go to the Brigham for two years of research. This is a long-standing exchange program we've had. It continues even to today. And I came and worked with two really great mentors, Stan Ashley um, and Ed Wong. Um, great surgeons, great, great, true triple threats. And their experience there really changed my mind. I, I started working on intestinal physiology, not, not on obesity, but actually on malnutrition and thinking about ways how we can increase intestinal absorption for people who are on TPN. But at the end of the two years, I was like, oh my god, I, I, I want to do this. Um, I think the background to this important to know is that as you, you enter this lab that I used to work as a, uh, as a research fellow and actually is the lab where I run now, there is this science, there's this lab is dedicated to Dr. Francis Moore. I don't know how many people here know Dr. Francis Moore, but um, I looked him up 20 years ago and he realized, wow, this is, this is a, really a remarkable man. He was uh, the surgeon, chief of surgery at the Brigham. He, was, had, he did all the initial fundamental work on identifying body composition. He was heavily involved in immunology. And he was one of the key people who helped with the first kidney transplant at the Brigham. He doesn't get credit for it, but he was really involved with that. And when he died, 
in the t uh, he was on the cover of Times, the, one of the comments that was made was that the sturdiest oak in American surgery has fallen. And really, like a remarkable person who did a lot as a surgeon scientist. Um, and inspired by the environment I was in, inspired by the mentors I had, really kind of enjoying the question I was doing, um, I, I decided I, I want to be an academic surgeon. I want to help I understand the disease, help develop uh, novel treatment. So the first, one of the first pillars of my career that I had a few years earlier, this I don't want to do research, went bygone, and I changed it. I did also make one, as I started residency at the Brigham, I developed one other rule, and that was I don't want to do bariatric surgery. And the reason was that at that time, that was a start of laparoscopic gastric bypass. And we as residents used to call the operation lap ruin your day because it used to take a long time. We never did any part of it anyway. Everyone went to ICU. It was just complicated. No one wanted to do this. Um, and, but, but, you know, as I learned more about the disease, as I learned about, went to clinics, and I saw how happy these patients were, how grateful they were, how the diabetes gets better, just really just amazed me. And, um, you know, there's a, one of my favorite paper titles. It's this paper with Walter Porritt, which first highlighted the anti-diabetic effects of bariatric surgery. And he says, an operation to prove to be the most effective therapy for adult onset diabetes. Who would have thought? The idea that you take a chronic medical condition, you do surgery, and you cure it. You shouldn't use the word cure, by the way. You remit it. It was really impressive. I, I also come from a family, at full disclosure, where diabetes is prevalent. Like, there's not a lot of obesity, but the middle, uh, um, um, I guess, overweight, there's diabetes. Um, my parents have diabetes, both of them. All four of my, four my grandparents have diabetes. My uncle was on dialysis. It is like I grew up with this disease, right? And then to think that you can do something to improve it was just really amazing. And then we started to kind of in the lab to say, okay, let's understand how gastric bypass works, and let's see how we can replicate it in a less invasive fashion. Um, so there's lots of theories what gastric bypass works. A quick run through. So initially, we used to think gastric bypass works because it's malabsorption. You're bypassing part of the intestine, so you can't absorb all the calories you eat. So and you, you suggest you poop it out, so there's caloric malabsorption. It turns out that's not the case. Now, you have sometimes micronutritional deficiencies in malabsorption because the duodenum is isolated, but you don't have caloric malabsorption. Um, and the other thing I thought was that, look, there's restriction. Like everyone talks about restriction and malabsorption. That means you have a small stomach, and to me it suggests you just can't fit enough food in it, right? The restriction means you're hungry, you want to eat, but this small stomach doesn't like, allow you in. And we know that's not the case. Actually, there's very little restriction that a pouch offers, but what it does do, it reduces your hunger, so your drive to eat is actually reduced. It's not physical restriction. Um, people have talked about a lot of hormones, GLP-1, um, which is a pro-insulin hormone, has been studied a lot and has shown to be a little bit important, but maybe not critical. People have talked about bile salts and microbiome, way above my intelligence to really fully understand, but complicated things. Um, but the area we've been interested in is that how does this rearrangement in the gut change g gut physiology and how can that potentially drive outcomes? So there's data to suggest that after bariatric surgery, and I'll talk about this in a little, more um, the intestine actually uses more glucose. So it becomes a pro-glucose a sink. And whether, how important that is, we'll talk about. And then there's also a good amount of evidence that isolating the proximal bowel from nutrient flow is a key step in the anti-diabetic effects of the surgery. So, um, we said, you know, we dedicated our lab to trying to understand, focusing on that last two or three aspects, the changes in intestinal physiology. And our goal was not to just discover, but really to translate. And this is a fundamental issue that I found, is that sometimes we do a lot of research, and we go down molecular pathways, and we publish really great papers, but it's kind of, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't really impact anything. So. One of the things we do in our lab is twice a year, we sit down with whatever we've learned, and we just go, do we know enough 
we don't know everything, but do we know enough to translate this into a new intervention or a drug or a step or whatever it is? And, and that's, that's a key part of it. So, uh, we, you know, have, uh, we kind of, to help us understand how important this proximal bowel was, we created this rodent model where we take uh, rats, we cannulate the jugular vein, we actually then um, um, cannulate the SMV, and then um, we also put a cannula in the duodenum. And what that allows us to do is to look at intestinal fluxes across the bowel. So the way this works is this, is that you have systemic circulation, it goes to your intestine, and then at, at a fasting, and then it's drained through the portal vein, right? So at a fasting state, the intestine uses some nutrients, including glucose. So at a fasting state, what happens is your portal glucose is less than your systemic. So your portal systemic glucose gradient is less than zero. When you go out, as, and this, by the way, measures essentially intestinal utilization of nutrients, glucose. And then, but when you go out, let's say you go to, we, we actually had a way better meal than burger last night, but let's say we ate that food. And what happens, the intestine still takes some glucose to absorb and um, use it for its metabolism but also there is absorption of nutrients, including glucose, into the portal vein. So what happens, your portal systemic glucose gradient becomes positive, and there's various mathematical formulations you can do, and you use this to assess intestinal glucose absorption. So you can assess how much glucose, uh, how much intestine uses glucose and stuff, and you can do it for other substrates, but we're particularly interested in glucose. Uh, So we, what we did with this uh, set of studies um, is that we uh, tied off in, in these animals the proximal bowel right at the pylorus. We infused glucose into the bowel, and, um, uh, and we, we assessed the measure of intestinal glucose absorption capacity. And then what we did was then we isolated the proximal bowel, similar to what you do in a gastric bypass. And we showed after duodenal exclusion your... Um, your intestinal glucose absorption goes down, which is great, which is what we expected. And then also, when you re-stimulate this isolated segment with an SGLT3, so we infuse that segment with lots of substrates to see what to try to understand, what's the mechanism that drives this um, duodenal isolation leading to glucose absorption. So we infuse it with lots of substrates, including an SGLT3 analog, glu um, alpha methyl glucose, and we showed that it can recreate and increase your glucose absorption again. And then when we did a vagotomy, this effect was abolished. And then when we did a chronic gastric bypass model, as we expected, the glu intestinal glucose absorption was decreased. Um, and then when we infuse this limb, this isolated limb with alpha methyl glucose, this SGLT3 inhibitor, uh, sorry, and uh, stimulate, your intestinal glucose absorption went, went way up. And in fact showed that in this isolated segment, you get a compensatory increase in this SGLT3 that increases, that explains why you get this rebound response here. But at the end of it, we realized, okay, for the, it, the physiology of duodenal isolation seems to be driven through this transporter SGLT3, and it's a vagally mediated process, and it leads to inter decreased intestinal glucose absorption, which has the anti-diabetic effects. Now, we've done a lot more work to try to understand. I'm going to come to that. But at that point, we had one of the, these kind of power of an innovation, like, can we, do, can we create an intervention right now without fully understand this story. Um, and we thought about this idea of, uh, oops. Uh, it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Um, that maybe we can create an intestinal, a pill that creates a temporary coating of the proximal bowel and hence help us replicate the effect of gastric bypass. This idea, we were not new to it, the idea that you can isolate the proximal bowel and have metabolic benefits. And, and, and as another startup called GI Dynamics had already started. They, they created an endoscopically sheet that you could anchor it into the genome. It isolates the proximal bowel, so kind of replicates the effect of the gastric bypass. And it, they had shown that they had really good anti-diabetic effects. 
they dropped their hemoglobin A1C by more than 1%. Patients came off medications. But this device had complications, and the FDA phase three trial was actually put on hold because of safety concern. So this gave us that idea that you know, we know the concept works. Let's see if we can create it in a less invasive fashion. And this is why, where my collaboration with Dr. Jeff Carper, um, uh, uh, biomaterial expert at the Brigham started, and essentially over a, a seven or eight year process, we worked on this project to see what compound we can think of that can create proximal coding. So we created an in vitro model where we um, had a mucous membrane, we had glucose, we coated it with a bunch of material to see what provides the best per, um, resistance, to, uh, resistance to permeation. And we found a few things, but interesting to us was sucrophate, a drug that already is available on the FDA and has antioxidant treatment, but it turns out it's a good glucose barrier as well. And not only was it good glucose barrier in terms of efficacy, it actually had good durability as well. So the question was, can sucrophate ref, uh, you know, be a good um, a coding agent? So we did a set of experiments where we gave uh, sucrophate to um, animals, and then we did CT scans to see if we get a coding on the intestine. It turned out we didn't. We get some, I don't know if you can see, there's some dots in the intestine, but really new, nice, beautiful coding on the proximal bowel that we had hoped. And then when we did oral glucose tolerance tests, it actually had no, no effect because obviously we didn't have a good coding. So then we have um, really started to work about like what we call the next generation sucrophobe-based liquid coding. And a few design criteria we had, we wanted to coat healthy bowel because sucrophate is good at health uh, coating ulcers. And we wanted to be actually pH independent because sucrophate needs the gastric pH to work. But we wanted this to be pH independent because so many people take PPIs and other stuff. And we just wanted to take that as, uh, out of the equation as we innovate. So this ultimately led to creation of LUCI, which stands for luminal coating of the intestine. And essentially, this is a white powder. You can hydrate it. It forms a paste. And this shows here that how in vitro you can form, as you put it on the bowel, you form a very nice homogeneous coating on the, um, on the intestine. Um, it's uh, adhesive. We've done lots of fancy tests, but frankly, you just shake it in a, <laughs> sh uh, in a beaker, and you can see it sticks. So it's got some good mucoadhesive properties. You just have to trust me on that one. Um, and then when we did CTs, you, unlike sucrophate, here you get a nice coating of the proximal bowel, in this duodenal coating and the proximal the distal stomach as well. And importantly, when we did anti-oral glucose tolerance tests, it led the administration of Lucy led to about a 47% reduction in area on the cur curb, which is a meaningful reduction when it comes to anti-diabetic interventions. Um, we also did other studies. We gave Lucy uh, um, sorry, orally and the glucose intraperitoneally, and we showed that Lucy had effect only when glucose was given orally. So this is uh, the, gut, the drug works on local, and there's no systemic absorption of the drug as well. And then we've done some subsequent chronic studies um, where we gave Lucy for about six weeks to animals um, on a once daily basis. And we showed that it led to a significant drop in fasting glucose levels. I'm going to jump here. It led to a modest, about an 8% weight loss. So not a lot of weight loss, but something. Um, but importantly, it, there was a massive drop in this insulin resistance model in fasting insulin as well. So at times zero, insulin was reduced by nearly a seven or eight fold. And then when we looked at other hormones that you kind of see that are important in glucose hemostasis, so um, GLP-1, which is a pro-insulin hormone, GIP, which is another pro-insulin, after Lucy administration, we had increased levels of both following an oral glucose tolerance test. Now, when you look at all this data, you know, the drop in fasting insulin, the insulin, the weight loss, the increase in GIP and GLP-1, GLP it seems like Lucy kind of mimicked gastric bypass. And, um, you know, encouraged by this data, we, as um, Dan mentioned, we have started a um, startup company. And I have to admit, this has been um, an incredibly interesting journey, which has highlighted my 
deepest ignorance. I have completely unprepared for it. I have no idea what's going on. I have to, it's been fun probably, but it really relied on a lot of advice. And it made me think that as we think about surgeon scientists and innovators, like we have an obligation to prepare these people for this translational step, which is probably the most important step, which we don't do a great job. And I think that's why the biodesign program here is so important to help with this um, transition. So I just kind of thought in the last few minutes, talk a little bit about this academic journey, the good, the bad, and the ugly part of it. So the good part of it, it's, it's remarkable, right? You, 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 you people, you publish, you see your names in uh, papers, you go to meetings, you present, people think of you as a thought leader. The best part of it, you get to come and give grand rounds and meet lots of people and just, it's, 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 it's fantastic. Uh, the bad part of it is that it's a tough road. This, this is, I'm ashamed to say, is my grant acceptance rate for the first few years of my academic career. So the first year I started, I wrote two grants. I got one of it, and I was like, oh, I don't know what these people are talking about. This is walk in the park. But I paid the price for it for the next few years with acceptance rates at, at around 10 years. At year six, I was actually going to pack up the lab and go. I had put a mental kind of block on say, that, you know, you don't want to flog a dead horse. If I can't do it, let's not torture myself, my family, and my chair, who I was constantly knocking on asking for money. Um, but fortunately, at year six, we did get an R01, and then the rest is um, uh, history. And this academic journey is like really full of up and downs. You have, you know, I, I, I wrote a bastard here. So Dr. Moore, who I mentioned to um, at the beginning, he compared an academic surgeon to a bastard who has his origin uh, either to, neither to a scientist n nor to a, research, to a surgeon, right? So as surgeons always say, these academic surgeons, they don't know how to operate, they're wasting our time, and the scientists go, these guys don't know how to do research because they're always in the operating room. So no one, you don't really have a home. Um, you get paid less, you work really hard, but it's, no one actually appreciates the work you're doing. And then when it comes to NIH funding, you, there's good data that surgeons for always have a lower success rate than any other thing. So it's a really uphill battle, and it's all over the place. Like you have good days, you have bad days, you have horrible days, you go back, you go forward, you want to give up, you don't want to give up. But ultimately, um, and it, it, I think if you stick to it, it's really worth it, although the attrition rate on this path is, is high, right? The majority don't, don't uh, end up doing it. And there's this kind of really ugly part of it as well, that this is uh, complicated. And, you know, we've talked about the triple threat. In reality, you're like multi-legged octopus, to be honest. So because, you know, there's the demands of leadership, there's demand of administration. And many days, and I don't know how Dr. Horn or Dr. Azagora feel, but I feel like this. Uh, each part of my brain is doing something, and I have no idea, but at the end of the day, somehow I've moved forward. I don't really know how it happens, but it just seems random. And it, 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 it takes a, a skill to do it. And it is, there's a lot of evidence that people have said this is not sustainable, right? And there was an um, article in the New England Journal about a year, no, no, maybe a few months ago, oh, no, actually a year ago, by one of our oncologists at Dana-Farber who talked about the grieving for the out of practice. Out of, uh, out of practice. And what he highlights here is that this idea of triple thread just should not exist anymore. The idea that you can be a good researcher good patient care provider and good uh, teacher is not, doesn't exist. And his proposal is that if you're really succeeding in research, you should give up clinical work. And that's what, in fact, he did. Now, I think for most of us, that's probably not an option. For surgeons, and for many, it's not. So I think what is key for success, and for me, is really working in really these focused teams and collaborators who are excellent. I, I showed you a lot of pictures for every research project I'm doing. I have a collaborator who is way better than me at doing what they do. For my administration, we have our own team. For our leadership, we have our team. For clinical work, we have our team. And I think success um, really nowadays um, is, it relies on this, and that's how you make the mission impossible um, possible. 
So, uh, you know, I think um, with a few minutes left, uh, you know, it, this is, I think it's important to highlight that despite all the bad and the negative news you may, may hear, there is a constant need for surgeon innovators. This is not surgeon scientists, this is not surgeon researchers, but these are surgeon innovators. And it's an incredibly rewarding uh, science, uh, field. And you may say, so what's happening to your science? I've, um, you know, I think we're continuing to do it. We're really interested in the role of the vagus nerve um, and, um, and, frankly, the role of portal vein in nutrient sensing. So I'll jump onto this. You know, we think of the portal vein as a very kind of a, um, a conduit, which is a little bit like a, oops, I, I'm going to jump this for time. Um, which is a, a conduit, uh, which is a lead pipe that connects the bowel to the intestine. But we've done a lot of studies now showing that after bariatric surgery, the um, portal milieu changes. So you're actually having a total different uh, substrate components in the portal vein after bariatric surgery. Your glucose level is up, your lipid profile changes, and we think that has the portal vein, in fact, has, is a very kind of active hub of neurosensory activities, and these changes are relayed to the liver, and they lead to the immediate and early anti-diabetic effects that we see after surgery. Um, a, 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 a kind of uh, invitation for the residents, we have a T32 in Boston on GI surgery. If anyone wants to give up the weather and ski for a few, couple of years, we will welcome you to apply and we'd love to have you there. Um, a variety of work is done. Our lab obviously focuses on what I talked about. Um, but with that, I just want to, again, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the Zoom, Zoom audience for listening and uh, thank you for this honor. <laughs>